Hello and welcome to Vibrant Lives Podcast, a podcast dedicated to your health and well-being, featuring interviews with experts about nutrition, physical health, mental health, and my five-minute food facts series. These are short episodes where I discuss nutrition-related topics. I am Amanda Hayes, your host. I'm a lawyer turned nutritionist and I'm on a quest to learn as much as I possibly can about living a healthy, active and fulfilling life, which I would call a vibrant life, and sharing what I learn with you on this podcast. This is my first episode of 2022 and I'm looking forward to sharing my podcast episodes with you this year. I hope that you all enjoyed a healthy and joyful festive season. I had a lovely time with my family, but it certainly didn't go to script. South Australia, where I live, opened its borders about a month before Christmas and, not unexpectedly, our COVID cases skyrocketed. First my son and then my daughter caught COVID and so we had two 10-day periods of home isolation, including on Christmas Day. However, forced family time, as a parent of teenagers, was actually a silver lining. Okay, so let's get to my first guest for this year. I'm here with Dr. Tammy Chang. Tammy is a physician in paediatric haematology and oncology. She practices in Tacoma, Washington. She's also a passionate advocate for women physicians and runs a consultancy business to help women doctors learn how to set boundaries, avoid burnout, and actually enjoy their work. Although Tammy's focus is on women doctors, I think her message applies to all busy people, particularly women who are faced with multiple pressures, work, family, managing a household, you know. So for all of you busy people out there, this episode is for you. Before we dive in, I'll quickly note that any information or advice provided in Vibrant Lives podcast is not intended to be used to treat or prevent medical conditions, and it's never a substitute for advice from your own health professionals. Okay, let's do it. 2022, here we come. Today I'm here with Dr. Tammy Chang, who is a paediatric haematologist and oncologist and an empowerment coach for women. So hi, Tammy. Hi, it's so good to meet you and be here on your show. It's such a pleasure. And I thought before we get stuck into some of the work that you're doing, I'd like to ask you some quick fire questions to get to know a little bit about you. So Tammy, where did you grow up? Portland, Oregon. Lovely. And what is your favorite form of exercise? Oh, I love to run and actually have really fallen in love with Tracy Anderson workouts recently. Oh, right. So I don't know who she is. Is she a, um, and sort of an online type of person that does um, things you can follow. It, yeah, great. Is it an yeah, all so body I'm sort of gym type thing, or is it Pilates, or kind of a combo? It's Pilates like, I think, right. out of all the different forms. But it's actually great for the aging body. Excellent. <laughs> I find it's great. No, very low impact. So I love it. Oh, that's fantastic! It's good that there are women out there doing things like that. I think. And Tammy, your go-to meal for dinner. So if you were working and you came home and wanted to cook something quick and healthy, what would that be? Oh, I would actually probably get takeout from our favorite Thai restaurant and it would be just fresh spring rolls. Yum. With tofu. Yeah. Oh, that sounds delicious. And what are you currently reading? Oh, I actually, I'm actually reading the Brene Brown's uh, most recent book. Atlas of the Heart. Have you read that one? I haven't. The one I've read, well, has started reading but haven't finished is, I think it's called Braving the Wilderness. Yeah. Yeah. I've got about 10 books next to my bed, <laughs> so, which is not great, but it means that I pick up the one that I'm in the mood to read. So I'm about halfway through that one. She, she's amazing, isn't she? She is. I love all of her work. Yeah. In fact, her name comes up reasonably often on my podcast. A lot of women um, listen to her and read her books. And Tammy, what are you listening to at the moment? It could be um, a podcast, an audio book, music. I've actually really been listening to the Charlie Brown soundtrack a lot. (laughs) 
<laughs> as in the the, the comic, comic no the, 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 yes the kids co- yeah because it, it kind of carried over from from charlie brown christmas and then i just wasn't ready to let go of the holidays so i switched <laughs> over to charlie the charlie brown soundtrack to by the vince Guaraldi trio and i just it just puts me in a good mood oh that's great need to fly to the moon that's like that's my favorite one on the track oh, brilliant and your favorite way to relax what's that oh just snuggling with my fur babies nice and you i believe have you got four I guess I do have four. I do have two golden retrievers and two cats. Oh, lovely. Oh, it's such a good thing to do, isn't it? So, Tammy, if we talk a bit about your background um, and your work, so at what point in your life did you know that you wanted to become a doctor? Well, that's a great question. I, I actually didn't know until I was about a teenager. And my, my father is a physician. Oh, okay. Well, that's really interesting because... I, I, I understand from friends that are in the medical field that a lot of them have this passion from quite a young age that that's really what they want to do. So you, in terms yeah. of your training, you completed your, I guess in Australia we'd probably call it undergraduate training at Brown University, and then you did a four-year combined internal medicine and paediatrics residency at the University of Massachusetts, and then a fellowship in paediatric hematology and oncology at the St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis. So you've clearly done a lot of training. When you started working as a young attending physician, was it how you imagined it would be? No, and that's a big big thing that I'm very passionate about Mm -hmm. now. It was so much harder than I thought it would ever be, and I thought training was pretty hard too. Right, that's really interesting. So you say, and this leads on from that obviously, that you say on your website that you suffered from debilitating burnout, and at one point you thought about quitting medicine, and that's the thing you'd worked so hard for, and you thought that that was at that point the only option, but then you decided to ask for help. Was that a difficult decision for you to ask for help? It was. It was not something that I had been trained to do mm. or felt was okay to do, especially in medicine. Yeah. And there's such a culture of soldiering on. Yeah. Even when things are tough. Yeah. I mean, my background is in the law. And I mean, it's different because you're not dealing with people's lives. So um, it's, I guess, not as urgent or present. But there, there is also that man- mentality of you just keep going you work long hours you don't complain um and yeah obviously in your case and I imagine many other women it becomes quite overwhelming and debilitating so driven by your own experience you then decided to expand your training um, in related but different ways um, so that you could support other women physicians so clearly you have a desire to help others but in your opinion, was the kind of help that when you were looking for it and needed it, was that lacking or hard to find for women doctors? Yes. And that's why everything I'm I'm part of now is it's really everything I wish I had a mm. few years ago that I, I wish was available for everyone else. Yeah. It's often the way that personal experience drives what you end up doing. Two years ago, I interviewed an Olympic rower, and she has now set up um, a consulting company for young women, elite sports people, and and that was yeah. driven by what she didn't have and what mm. she wished she knew at the time. Yeah. So I can see how that can, can evolve from your own experience. And the other thing that I find really interesting, Tammy, is why did you decide – to tailor your program to women. So in other words, what are the specific pressures that face women physicians? Yeah, I don't know what it's like in Australia, so I can't wait to to learn from you and your your community too. In the United States, it's it's very tough for the women physicians. We're we're finally more than 50% of oh, medical that's good. students, which is huge. But we know that 40% of women physicians are actually quitting or going part-time within six years. And what, is, and what do you th- think about um, why particularly is it hard for women? Is it because they're juggling other things as well? Yes, it's that. And I think you had that same, has another question about 
is it similar to other professional women yes. too as well? And absolutely, it's it's the pressures outside of work, it's the pressures at work, it's a combination of multiple factors. Yeah, and unfortunately, it seems that even in this day and age, most of the household duties sort of fall on the shoulders of women. And yeah. so women who are working, juggling family, it's 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 really difficult, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it absolutely. I think it is for all women. Right? Yeah, so do I. But I think probably the thing for women doctors is that because you're in a caring role, it's probably even harder because you feel that pressure from the people that you're your patients and their families and you have that strong sense of wanting to be there and help them yeah before we so we've talked a little bit about the pressures so before we go on and and deal with some solutions I just wanted to quickly ask you because it's so topical and I know it's hard to answer this in a in a short way but what's the COVID pandemic been like for physicians has it how has it impacted the daily expectations and stress loads of physicians in, in general yeah in general just in the u.s well where i guess in terms of what you've seen oh yeah my my work at separate from a coach is, is actually provider wellness i'm the director of provider wellness for my large healthcare system mm-hmm. so that's actually what i do is help to make make things better and create a true culture of, of wellness and well-being for all the physicians. We have 4,000 in our system. Oh, right. They are struggling. Every single one is struggling. Oh, that's yeah. so hard, isn't it? I think in the US, the pandemic's probably been even more extreme than it has been here in Australia. But I know there's been a lot of here anyway, elective surgery has been put on hold and and things like that. And when when you hear the word elective surgery, you, you think, oh, maybe that's um, something that someone doesn't need. But actually, it's 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 important surgery that's been put on hold. So you know, it's had a huge impact on people's day to day lives. I think. Yeah. Oh, everywhere. I mean, that's the case worldwide. Yeah. Right. That's the one one universal experience of all that we're all going through. Yeah, it, it is fascinating in that sense, isn't it? We might have these boundaries on maps, but the pandemic doesn't care about those. No boundaries. No. Yeah. So you said it's very difficult for physicians and particularly women. And so I guess the thing um, that's really interesting and where your work comes in is looking at some of the solutions So a big part of what you do as a leadership and empowerment coach is to help women physicians learn how to set boundaries. So I think a good place to start is first, can you explain to us what do you mean by boundaries? What are they? And secondly, why are they important? Oh, for sure. I didn't know what they were, honestly, until actually about three, four years ago myself. So much. I was a grown up by then. Right. Yeah. Working. And the, the, the concept's been around since the 1980s, uh, first introduced by therapists and self-help groups. Mm-hmm. And then it was made very popular in the 1990s by Townsend Cloud's first book, Boundaries. And so they've written over a dozen books, of course, since then on boundaries. And in essence, it, all it is, is that invisible line mm-hmm. between what is ours and what is not. And I think in particular for women and for women physicians, what we struggle with most Maybe it's like this for, I think it's like this for a lot of women. It was just what's our responsibility and what's yeah. not. Yeah. Yeah. And why then is it important to have boundaries? When we take on, I think as women, there's um, there's been a really great book written. The, have you read the book, The Burnout? Unlocking no. the, Secret, the Secret to Unlocking the Stress Cycle by the Nagoski Sisters. And it's a wonderful book. And they talk about human giver syndrome which is almost a universal plight of women. Mm -hmm. And so you take women and then women physicians. So we're already nurture. We're already socialized to be nurturers, to be caretakers, Mm -hmm. to care, to give, to care, care for others. And, and then you throw medical training on top of that, which is when we're right. Like you said, we're here to care for others and we put everyone else first. Mm -hmm. And so then you end up with this, this, the cycle of giving that doesn't end and just severe burnout. Yeah, because if you're 
always giving and doing nothing to replenish yourself at at some point you say as you said you'll reach burnout there's almost nothing more to give yeah i think yeah. a lot of women are what they what psychologists call people pleasers like they're very yeah. keen to make sure that everyone else is okay and it's hard i mean society as you say enforces that role as well so it's quite hard to break away from that so on your website which i will put a link to in the show notes you have a boundaries workbook and the thing you start with exercises about self awareness where you ask the person doing the workbook to write down an activity person or task and then select whether that gives them energy it zaps their energy or it's somewhere in between and i really like that because everyone's obviously going to have different answers and so it then becomes a very personalized thing. I think what I'm most interested in is the energy zappers and how to set boundaries around them because we all have energy zappers in our, in our lives. And I thought it might be a good exercise if I could mention a few common, I suppose, yeah. energy zappers. And if you could give us some pointers on potential boundaries that, that a woman could, could set around those. So the first sure. one I think would be, um, and probably everyone's experienced this at some point, a demanding colleague or boss that that expects immediate responses to everything they ask. So they expect you to drop what you're doing to deal with their needs. So how would someone set some boundaries around that kind of behavior? That is such a common example, mm. right? I think we've all been through something like that. And it depends on how that person is is reaching out. So sure. is it by email? Is it by a text message? Is it stopping by your door and asking for things? Uh, and so what I, what I coach women to do is depending on the method, the form in which it's arriving mm -hmm. or coming toward you is to then set boundaries around that. So if it's a text message, you don't have to text back right away. If it's an email, it doesn't have to be right away. It's not an emergency. If they're at your door, you can you can keep your door closed and yeah. you can also set boundaries around when you'll be answering the door. And the best thing is, of course, to first address it, try yes. to address it honestly, right? Openly and honestly with that person. And if that doesn't isn't as effective, right, then you can still use these other strategies. And what I actually share with other women, and I've actually tried this and experienced it myself, if we notice the rate at which we respond to things will actually control how quickly they come back to us. So for instance, if you get an email, if you respond back right away, that you might get an email back again. Right. Whereas if you wait 12 hours, it slows it down, the response rate. So it's even just putting some guardrails around our own response. We don't have to react every single time to whatever's being asked of us. That's really good advice because I think – particularly if you're a young woman starting out, you're so eager to please that your instinct would be to immediately respond. So to actually take it upon yourself to perhaps take a deep breath and wait, you're right, it does put a bit of a stop gap in there. And I guess if something was really urgent, that's different, you know, you would respond. But if it's something that doesn't need to be dealt with immediately, then hmm, take your time. <laughs> A couple of other examples, and I think pretty much everyone in the world will probably relate to this one, is keeping up to date with emails. It just seems to me that there's this never-ending <laughs> onslaught of emails. I find it quite overwhelming. If, For example, if you don't check your computer for a day or two, which is quite rare, I guess, um, you come back and there's hundreds, and it's you sometimes don't even know where to start. So how would you, do you have any strategies for managing emails? Yes. And <clears throat> excuse me, I have the same struggles too. So I've tried many things myself. What I, this is actually very similar to what I recommend for women physicians too, because we as a whole struggle with our charting. Mm -hmm. So that's patient counters and charting. And I, I view, I view email in the same kind of way. And so I, actually recommend li limiting your email check time to two specific times, yep. right? The same times every day, mm -hmm. not checking any time between them. If it's something really urgent, someone can always call your phone, right? Yeah. And also try not to check on the phone because it's so easy just to check and look, right? Anytime of the day. And so I, I time box 
that period of time, make it 20, 30 minutes. You're as efficient as possible during that 20, 30 minutes and anything we don't get to, that's it. And I also recommend a one touch email strategy too. So you touch an email once and then either it goes into a folder, it goes into the trash or whatever, or you respond to it right away so that you're not having to come back to it again later too as well. Yeah, I think that's an excellent um, bit of advice and actually one that I've, I think I'll try and follow myself because I often <laughs> read an email, think, oh, I'll answer that later and then read it the next day, oh, I'll answer that later and, uh, you know, you might end up reading the same email five times, whereas in that time you could have dealt with it. <laughs> so Yeah, it could be done by then too, yeah. right? <laughs> the, and the one more example of a um, an energy zapper, it's, uh, it's one that I struggle with <laughs> And that is grocery shopping. It just never oh. seems to end. Like it's, <laughs> I know, it, I know it's part of our life. But do you have some strategies about how to make it a bit more manageable and less of a, a an energy zapping burden? Well, I have to be completely honest. We have Instacart in the United States. Okay. Do you have something like that. Is that an online shopping? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, we do. Yeah. Mm. So. My, we've chosen, it's actually an energy zapper for me and my husband. And so we've chosen not to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. We, we outsource. So do do you just go online and, and order what you want and then someone delivers it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that does make sense. What about with fresh fruit and vegetables? Do you even that? Yeah. All of it. Okay. Yeah. And it does cost a fee, right? But we, we view our time and our energy as, as just as important as, the maybe five dollars it costs to yeah to do that. we have a subscription over the year that we save okay money the time that's a, well. that's a good idea because I think if you value your time and you factor that in then it's worth the fee like the fees cost less than your time or especially our energy I think yeah exactly exactly on this topic of energy zappers because I'm I'm quite fascinated by this mm. what if an energy zapper is a chore, something that you have to do, something that you you can't not do. Like, for example, you can't decide I'm just never doing the laundry again because it zaps my energy. One thing I think of is something like cooking a meal for your family. I know that you can get takeout, but that's not always a healthy option. So what about those energy zappers, that things that we we absolutely have to do. We can't outsource. Do you have some strategies around those kind of energy zappers? Well, I think I actually think there are ways to to share the load mm-hmm. or to outsource, even when we think we can't. And yep. our, I know I have many friends in, who live in areas where the families will take turns cooking too, right? They'll, they'll cook share so that each family only needs to cook once a week, for instance. And uh, there are ways to have food delivered, et cetera. But, but I think also too, I, to answer your question about what to do when you really have to do it, right? I think there also are ways to modify and modulate how we think about it, mm-hmm. which then impacts our emotions and then how we feel about it and then our behavior. So it, it can help to think, maybe we, maybe we can turn a zapper a little bit into a meh, like an in-between, yeah. right? It it's may not be something we love, we'll ever love, but we can maybe make it a little bit less painful. Painless. Okay. So cook share, that sounds intriguing. Is that when, for example, you might cook a meal for, say, you have a brother and his family, so you cook double and give mm-hmm. him some and then he would do the same. If, that's a good idea. Yeah. I'd never really... Or- or if you we live we live in a little cul-de-sac mm-hmm. area and uh, you can always do a meal literally a meal share so it could be five families coming over for dinner once a week but then the other six days of the week you have meals at their homes. All right, wow! Or even if you just deliver the food without having right because sometimes you just want to be at home and relax, don't you? Without other people <laughs> in your house. Right. Um, Another thing you mention on your website is that you were a dutiful and hardworking student and doctor, and I think those things go hand in hand. You know, if you're studying medicine, it's very likely that you're hardworking because it's a difficult course. And many women, in my observation, do have a very strong sense of duty to others, to their families, to their employers. And we have touched on this, but 
that kind of duty is, is possibly amplified in women physicians because they care for others, as, as we've mentioned. So I couldn't help thinking that setting boundaries would be something that might be quite difficult for women physicians and may bring up feelings of guilt, guilt about putting themselves in quotes first. So how do you advise women who are facing those issues? I think you've hit the nail on the head. (laughs) Guilt is the most common thing I hear. We hear, I feel bad. Mm. I just feel so bad. I feel guilty for saying no, for not helping. I'm not a good team player if I'm not helping, right? I hear that over and over again. And what I actually try to help them understand is that that guilt actually can be a, a really good sign that that's where the boundary needs to be set. Right. And then we start to work on the guilt piece, which is often very deeply emotional and it's mm. been there for years, like decades, right? So, but I, it's a, it's a, it's a self-awareness piece. When there's guilt, it's usually a sign that there's either a core value that's not being honored or something that's really core to who that woman is that just isn't being honored. They don't really want to do it, but they're feeling like they have to or yeah. they should. Yeah, that's so interesting. It's such a conundrum for women, isn't it, that that feeling of guilt? and But as you say, one of the things about this is that if you look after yourself, then you're better able to look after others. So that's um, something, I guess, that women need to understand, isn't it? Absolutely. And so much of what I see women trying to do too is to try to model it for the next generation as Mm. well. So we're modeling for our our kids that it's okay. In fact, it's important to for mom to take a break. Yeah, that, right? yeah. It's it's funny. I do a lot of um, running and and that kind of thing, and it is one area of my life that I never feel guilty about <laughs> because mm. it makes me so much happier. I'm a much nicer person to be around. Just ask my husband if I if I can't <laughs> exercise for some reason if I've got a you know sore leg or it's cold or something. I'm, yeah. I can be quite grumpy. So <laughs> it's a win-win if I'm – and also, yeah. I, I, as you said, it's good modelling for the family. Mm-hmm. It'd be nice to hear about some of the successes that you've seen. So um, when you've coached some women physicians to successfully set boundaries, what's some of the feedback or the type of feedback that you've received? They share it's changed their life. Wow. They have a freedom that they didn't think was possible. I mean, I've seen just women come alive. It's it's incredible, really. It doesn't take a lot. Even. Mm. And that to me then just feeds me wanting to do this more, right? To help more women. We have, the, the summary is that women, we have so much more agency than we realize. We yeah. have so much more choice. But I guess that must be very rewarding. And I guess you are making women aware of that, aren't you? You're helping them. So that, yeah, that's that's great. I'm really happy to hear about that. And so you have two businesses um, dedicated to supporting other women physicians, your personal coaching and consulting business, which we've been talking about, but you also have one called Pink Coat MD with your friend Louisa Duran. Is that how you say her name? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so can you give us a, a, a brief overview of of each of those and, and what what you do in those businesses? Oh, sure. So in my coaching and consulting, I, I work one-on-one in small groups with women physicians on just exactly what we've been talking mm-hmm. about, empowerment, leadership. That's the other piece oh, leadership. I'm so passionate about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love seeing women rise and go for it, right? And then Pink Code MD is a community that I co-founded with my medical school classmate from Brown. We've actually been friends since we were freshmen in college. Oh, lovely. We've been friends for years, right? She's, she's family. And we did that because we both struggled so deeply just a few years into our attending hood and wanted to do something to help others and to exactly like we talked about at the very beginning, create what we couldn't find ourselves at the time. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. fantastic. Um, and the other nice thing about that is that you've obviously created a community, so you've provided support for lots of women facing the same issues. That's the hardest part is to find other women you feel safe sharing with, right? Yeah, of course. And I think with something like being an attending physician, it's 
the the issues that you face are quite specific so it's it's good to have other women facing the same thing isn't it so you can really understand each other yeah it's it's a pretty i we just feel so so grateful to be part of this work because it it helps us too yeah be part of that same community oh that's wonderful and congratulations because you have a book that's about to be published mm-hmm. And it's called Boundaries for Women Physicians, Love Your Life and Career in Medicine. So why did you decide to write a book? Well, because boundaries is such a tough topic for women physicians, and yeah. we, we need a book on it. I would love to see a dozen books on it for us. So I hope this is just one to help spread that message of hope that it's it's possible to have another a life, a different kind of life than most women physicians are live, are, tr- are honestly trying to get through today. And I guess the other thing is it'll, it can have a lot of reach if there's someone for, for whatever reason that, that can't have a one-on-one session with you, they could read your book. So that's a nice way of getting it, getting the message out into the wider yeah. world, isn't it? Just hoping to help anyone. If someone wants to buy a copy of that when it's available, which I think is, is it early March or Feb? February 3rd. Oh, mm-hmm. very soon. Yes. Very soon. Um, yeah. <laughs> where where will it be available? It'll be on Amazon. Amazon. Okay, that's yeah. great. So easy to find. And how did you find the writing process? Was it difficult for you or did you enjoy it? I really enjoyed it. I actually created the summary proposal for the book in about a day. Oh, right. I was just very inspired and I, I, I just just kept going. So yeah. it, it was a, it was a wonderful process. I learned so much through it. Absolutely. I guess, you know, the material very well. And so it's really, I, I imagine it's a nice exercise to summarize it really succinctly and concisely and be able to explain it all to someone else. Tammy, if you were speaking with a young woman who wanted to become a doctor, she was thinking about going to medical school. What advice would you give her? I think two things, well, maybe many things, but two I can think of. The first one is we have to put our own oxygen mask on first before we can help anyone else. And so your own needs and your own well-being is the is your number one priority. Mm-hmm. And the second one too, in the ni- United States for sure, I don't know what it's like in Australia, but for physicians, our, our identity is so closely tied to our profession. And I think it's also what I would say to a young young woman is you are a human being first before you're a physician. And so you, then again, go back to number one, take care of yourself first before you can take care of others. Mm. Oh, that's excellent advice. I think the systems are a bit different um, over in the US compared with Australia. Yeah. I think probably one of the central differences that I'm aware of, and I'm, obviously I'm not a doctor, so uh, I, I can't comment with complete precision but over here we have what's called a general practitioner and -hmm. they're the person that you will go and see and then they'll refer you off to various Mm -hmm. different specialists and so they're the person that has you know holds your medical records gets to know you does all your checks like blood pressure and things like that whereas I believe in the U.S. you have family physicians but people will often choose the person they want to see is that is that correct? Mm-hmm. That, that's true. They can. I think sometimes they still need the referral to a specialist. Oh, I'm, right. I'm a specialist. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, in any well, event, the, the systems are a bit different, but the training, I believe, is equally rigorous. Mm. It's, it's time to wrap up our lovely chat. So, Tammy, I saw on your website that you love to play the piano and you enjoy playing Rachmaninoff and Chopin. So you must be pretty good. <laughs> So how oh. often do you play the piano? Oh gosh, I, re- I don't, I ne- never, not enough now. I, mm. I did a lot growing up, so maybe once a week at best. I, I could always do more. And do you find, is that um, an outlet, a relaxation for you? It is, absolutely. It's yeah. very loud though in our house, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah. who inspires you? I really admire Michelle Obama in yes. the United States. I just admire her so much yeah she, she inspires me yeah. she is quite an amazing woman isn't she she managed really? to navigate that role absolutely perfectly i think she she had some excellent programs she promoted health 
but she yeah. also managed to just come across as such an authentically lovely person and very clever and articulate as well. <laughs> and all the things. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And the final question that I like to ask all of my guests is, if you could recommend two things, they can be anything at all that people mm -hmm. could do to improve their well-being, what would they be? I would say the first one is sleep. It's under under recognized, yeah. undervalued. And oh my goodness. And in medicine, it's so funny that we tell people to get sleep and we rarely get good sleep mm. ourselves. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I would say the sleep and the exercise. I mean, I'd have to throw in the healthy food, right? I mean, that all goes together. Yes, it does. It's it's all it's all linked up, obviously. It's interesting, isn't it? You know sleep is important, but your job is such that it's hard to get enough. Right. Yeah, Especially but maybe that's where that. setting boundaries comes in. <laughs> right. We have to we have to make those boundaries or it, it's very easy to, for that to, to slide. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. A lot of my guests have said sleep in response mm, to that yeah. question. So it seems like people are becoming more aware of I mean, sleep is good for us physically, obviously. It's where a lot of repair happens, but also mentally. It's how we form memories and it's good for our brain. Absolutely. And our mental and emotional well-being as well. Yeah, of course. So, Tammy, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure to chat with you. And I will put a link to your websites. And when the book is published, I'll pop a link to that as well in the show notes. So I, th I hope you have a lovely rest of your day. It's it's evening over there and it's the next morning here in Australia. Oh, it's morning where you are. Okay. Yeah, so I think you're Wednesday evening. I'm Thursday morning. Okay, you're ahead of us. We're yeah. ahead, yes. <laughs> you're in the future already. <laughs> I'm in the future. I'm talking to the past. <laughs> oh, it's pretty cool. <laughs> it is pretty cool, isn't it? And it's cool that we can talk to each other yeah, like this. this. It's amazing. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. It's a, been oh, a real pleasure. Doing. And I can, I'm actually looking, even though I'm not um, a woman physician, I am looking forward to reading your book because I think a lot of the messages in there will be relevant just to women living busy, busy lives. I hope so. That's my, that's my hope. Great. And my dream for others. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And that was Dr. Tammy Chang sharing some of her wisdom around setting boundaries. Thank you so much for listening today. And I do hope that you enjoyed the episode. If you did, please share the podcast and tell your friends about it. And if you could take a minute to leave a rating on Apple Podcast, it will help people find my podcast, and I'm always really grateful for that. You can subscribe to Vibrant Lives Podcast on most good podcast providers like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Overcast, iHeartRadio, and Google Podcasts. And you can also subscribe on YouTube. Please follow me on Instagram at vibrant underscore lives underscore podcast and check out my website at www.vibrantlivespodcast.com. There you'll find a library of all my podcast episodes and reviews of books I recommend and more. So please do DM me or send me an email via the contacts page on my website and let me know what you'd like to hear more of or learn about or simply just to say hi. Thank you so much for tuning in. Eat well, move well, think well.